So this morning, following the service, is the annual congregational meeting. It's been my experience, and that it's kind of customary for a minister to use the service before the congregational meeting is to offer some thoughts about the church. Sometimes this takes the form of a review of the previous year. Sometimes this takes the form of some reflections on the state of the church. Sometimes there's a particular focus on one important aspect of our life together as a religious community. And sometimes the time is used to urge us forwards towards uh, some vision or objective or goal that might lie before us. And so this morning, I want to use uh, this bully pulpit to offer an extended meditation on the subject of leadership in the liberal church and its perils. And, and I realize that that is uh, here kind of playing insider baseball, and we're not, all, we're not all members of the church here. And so I want to say that my words also apply or may apply to you in any kind of organization or setting um, or family system where you may find itself. You may find that if the words don't, don't apply here necessarily, they may apply to some other dimension of your life. I want to begin by going off topic a little bit, and then don't worry, I will, I will circle back and, and come back to what I, what I hope to say. But I want to begin by reading an old piece about church, an uh, ancient piece that every so often gets dusted off and passed around. It's a humorous piece, but I warn you, its humor is edgy. And I think you can, we can handle that, right? We can handle some edgy humor. So the title of the piece, I can't believe I'm reading this, is Games People Play at Church. And it goes like this. Dear church leader, you may recognize some of the games that people at church have been known to play. There's hide and go seek. This game is played when an upset person decides to go hide and waits for other church members to form a search party. Oftentimes, nobody is told that they're supposed to play this game. So the upset person has to return and announce loudly that they're going to go hide. Tag. Tag is a favorite game to play with a new volunteer, perhaps the person who has agreed to organize a community event or chair a committee. Simply have the volunteer agree to take on the role, the bigger the better, and watch everyone else run away from that person as quickly as possible. <laughs> Croquet. When someone has a creative idea for a new ministry, punish that person by inviting them to play croquet. Set up wickets, procedures, forms, applications, <laughs> finance committee meetings, board meetings, and watch as the person tries to maneuver through all the hoops. Other experienced players get to act as gatekeepers and can have fun by trying to knock the person trying to get through the hoops off course. Simon says, most churches have someone who likes to be Simon. The game is simple. Simon tells other people what to do and then criticizes them when they don't do it the right way. <laughs> Telephone, person A wants to get a message to person B. So person A tells person C, who tells person D, who tells person E, and so on, until eventually person B gets a message that has nothing to do with the original message. <laughs> and musical chairs. Watch the people move around the room as the music plays. Why do they all look nervous? Now the music stops, and they all fight to get something for themselves without any concern for others. Look, they're playing again, but this time it's a smaller group. Don't they know the winner winds up sitting alone? Dear church leader, these are just a few of the games that people have been known to play in church. Play these games at your own peril. You should identify these games when they're being played and tell those playing them not to be so childish. The end of that reading. So the author of this piece seems interested. Kind of an edgy reading, right? I heard some of you laughing, so good. 
so, so the author of this piece seems interested in writing about games that involve kind of destructive behavior. But I wonder if there aren't games that are a bit healthier to play in church life. So instead of playing telephone, you might play direct communication, where you speak directly with the person who you need to speak to. Or instead of croquet, where the goal is to set up hoops for someone to work through, you might play a game called permission giving, where those in the church community feel empowered to make things happen with the bare minimum of red tape. Or instead of musical chairs, maybe the goal is to play reverse musical chairs, where those who play the game work cooperatively to expand the circle, always adding more seats and inviting more people to play. Not a game of anxiety and scarcity, but of joy and gratitude and abundance and a sense of moral obligation. When, when I arrived, there was a seat for me. Someone made sure there was a seat for me and welcomed me to play. It's therefore my obligation to keep expanding that circle, keep adding more chairs, make the welcome even more welcoming. These variations, while healthier, are kind of clunky as games. And so I wondered if there weren't other games that we could be encouraged to play in the life of the church. My mind began searching through those playground games from my youth, racking my brain to try to find one that I might recommend as a metaphor for our life together. Dodgeball? No. Red Rover? Certainly not. Darts? Heavens, no. I thought about games that our youth play at lock-ins. I, I went to Marion and asked Marion, so what are, the, what are the games that our youth are playing? And, and she described sardines and wink and silent football, all, all fun games, but none of them really work well as a metaphor for congregational life. Then suddenly, as if by epiphany, I remembered one of those childhood games that seemed like it might have something to do with our life in the church. And with our annual congregational meeting and recognition of volunteers today, I decided to suggest the game, Follow the Leader. Who remembers playing Follow the Leader as a kid? Here's how to play the game. When children play Follow the Leader, they take turns being the leader. That's the important thing. They take turns. The leader does a series of improvisational movements, and everybody else pays attention and mimics what the leader does, right? Some of you are not playing, that's okay, you know? <laughs> and if I remember the game correctly, right, that's pretty much all there is to it. But the key thing I remember about this game is that it's fun to the extent that the leader is fun. If the leader does boring, repetitive movements, people get bored, right? Oh, time, for, time for a new leader, right? If the leader is lethargic and uninspired, the people get restless. But if the leader is too much of a show-off doing stunts, you don't want the, what if the leader does like a handstand, right? That's, that's chaos too, not too exciting. Or body, body contortion, what if, you know, you don't. Then the game becomes really uncomfortable. So what would it look like for follow the leader to be a metaphor for the church. First of all, I want to point out within Unitarian Universalism, within, I think, human nature as a whole, but within Unitarian Universalism specifically, there is a culture of Unitarian Universalists being hard on their leaders. What's that joke? Leading a bunch of UUs is like trying to herd cats? Or leading a bunch of UUs is like pushing a wheelbarrow full of frogs. And this gets acted out, not necessarily in our church, but, but it gets acted out uh, in our denomination, certainly. Here's an example of what I mean. Um, this past week, a, a group of Unitarian Universalist leaders, um, both those who worked for the denomination and, and people who were at seminaries and, and parish ministers and religious educators and musicians and administrators came together. They were invited um, to a, a summit, kind of a, a think tank, and it was, the theme was the economic sustainability of, of church and ministry. Um, and so what had happened was the UUA had really called together a group of people who they wanted to ask 
their opinions and get them to kind of together in the same place and do kind of a think tank as creativity. But as people began to, began to say, oh, I'm heading off to this thing, there began to be on, on social media and elsewhere this, this uprising. People were, why wasn't I invited? What's happening? This lacks transparency. Who gets invited? What's the agenda? And everybody began to criticize, without even learning what the conversation was, people began to criticize this event for taking place, which is a, which is a really interesting which is a really interesting reaction. I myself have been, um, and that, that those, those kind of summits on different themes seem to be kind of what we do. And each time we do one, people like jump on the people who, who attend. And some of that's borne out by jealousy. Why wasn't I invited? And, and some of it's just borne on the fact that we just don't trust our leaders. I was invited to two of those summits. Um, uh, seven years ago and five years ago on kind of growth in the congregation and how to do congregational growth. And, um, and it was really interesting. So, so I, people came up, people were like, well, why wasn't, why wasn't I invited to this? And I'm like, I, didn't, I didn't put it together. I was just invited. I said, yes. I... <laughs> but I want to contrast that, that difficulty. Do you, is, is, do you, do you agree? Do, do, are, are, are you used if, do they, are they tough on their leaders? Yeah? Okay. But I want to contrast that observation with something else, which is that we have articulated a deep longing for leaders. If you take a look at our strategic plan, the development of leaders is the biggest goal that we aspire to as a church. It is the, the, the topic in the strategic plan that comes up the most number of times. Leadership development has its own section in the strategic plan that says we're going to develop a formal leadership development program to nourish, support, and engage our current leaders and help develop a pool of new and adaptive leaders for all aspects of church life. And we're going to expand commitment to lay leadership development by offering regular courses that support new and current church leaders and support those developing callings and ministries in their personal lives and in the world. But more than that, throughout all of the other goals, there is a regular mention of expanding the pool of leaders, recruiting new leaders, training leaders, developing leaders. Isn't this interesting? That there's an articulated yearning for leadership, and then there is a reality, which is a suspicion of leaders in the church. It is an interesting paradox. It's a paradox that bears watching. So that's going to be the end of part one of the sermon. And part two is I'm going to talk a little bit about the leaders in the church here. So the theory, and then I'm going to talk about us a little bit and do some gratitude and appreciation. So in, in between, we're going to have um, a song, which is printed out in your order of service. Um, and the community singers and the choir are going to sing it as well. And at the same time, as if that's not enough, we're going to make you multitask this morning. Um, we're going to have the ushers come forward generously, uh, or gratefully we have received from life's abuzz, abundance, and generously we give back. This morning's offering goes uh, beyond our walls to support the Benevolence Fund and the Minister's Discretionary Fund, and we invite you to give generously. So all of the, the, the first hymn and, and that offertory song and the closing hymn, they're all written by, by a UU musician from um, Nashville named Jason Shelton. So it's like, it's like Jason, Jason Shelton music morning at our church this morning. So... Um, so earlier this spring, I, I met with the church council, and I brought them, when I met with them, this large sheaf of paper. It was the handout from the previous year's annual meeting, or the previous year's annual meeting, uh, several pages long, printed front and back, listing in microscopic font all of the volunteers who had volunteered in the church in the previous year, um, and inserted within the sheaf was an addendum listing additional volunteers who had been left out 
as well as corrections to the volunteer appreciation handout. And, and I learned from the council that, that more errors were found and that somebody proposed printing an addendum to the addendum. Uh, but then by that point, people just thought, we're going to have to go with what we go with. <clears throat> and, so, and so I showed this volunteer thank you sheet to the church council. I thought, I'm, I'm you know, interested in fit, fitting with the culture. And so I asked if they would all help me by, by sending me the names of all the volunteers they wanted to make sure were thanked. And so here's how the church council reacted. I kind of jotted down their responses. Not that again, <laughs> one of them said. What a waste of time. What a waste of paper said a member of the eco-committee. Most people just dump the paper as they're leaving church that morning. It's such a setup, said a third. There's no winning. You'll inevitably forget to thank someone, leave someone's name off the list, and all you'll do is make someone feel left out. And the feedback continued. Tom, you've got much better things that you could be doing with your time. And someone said, I've been volunteering with the church for more than a decade, and I've never felt appreciated because my name was printed on a piece of paper with 500 other names. This is like, there was like an insurrection on my hands at the council meeting. <laughs> Let's not do it, one of them said. As the leaders and ministries of this church, as the leaders of the committees and ministries of this church, another said, let's take a vote not to have a volunteer list this year. All in favor say aye, and it was unanimous. <laughs> Leadership in action. But then I said to them, I said, it's, it's important, right? We're, we, we do need to decide it's important to thank our leaders and volunteers, right? That's, that's important to tell them that they're appreciated. We have to do something. Oh, Tom, we're, we're sure you'll come up with something. <laughs> so so I, I came up, there's something, that I, there's something that I came up with, and it's going to be kind of a little activity that, that is going to keep us, that's going to keep us um, engaged while I, while I talk for a little bit. So, so I have to tell you, this past week was Arts and Crafts Night at the Belote Household. Anne and I, and I have to say thank you to my amazing wife, Anne. I have no idea why she puts up with me. Um, we created... 250 handmade chalice magnets. And so I figured that and we, we'll, we'll have enough for everybody here. Don't worry, they won't run out. If, they, if any of the magnets, if, I brought actually super glue, so if, if any of the magnets fall off of the little glass. And so what I'm going to do um, is, is on, on this side here and, and this side here, I brought several trays of them, is I'm just going sort to of, sort of send them to them, and you guys can pass them around, and everybody I want to take... A, take a, a magnet as a, as a symbol of, of my thanks to you. So don't worry, you may be the leader of, you know, the, the largest committee in the church, or you, you may have given out orders of service on a Sunday, or you may have stayed and washed the dishes, or you may not have volunteered for anything this year, in which case by taking it, you're, you're giving, you're saying that you will volunteer. <laughs> There's actually so. Uh, this is this is radical. So Glenn, Glenn, would you help me out here? So we've got we've got the trays. Anne gets her cookie trays back, and so we can do one tray on one side and one tray on another side, and then the third in the in the back. And yeah, so. And so as, as, they're, uh, as they're going around, it may, they may continue to go around. Um, I'm, I'm reminded in this, in this exercise of Jesus' parable of the workers in the vineyard. Does anyone know the, the parable of the workers in the vineyard? Um, what happens is, is, there, is a, there is a guy who, uh, who owns a vineyard and he needs laborers to come um, and do the work, and so at at, at eight o'clock in the morning, or at the you know at dawn, a group of laborers come, and he tells the labor uh, the the owner of the vineyard tells the laborers that for your day's work I will pay you one one denarius, and so the laborers decide that's a fair a fair price, and they begin to harvest the grapes and do the work of the vineyard. 
Um, and then around noon time, um, some, some more laborers show up and there's enough work. There's, a, there's quite an abundant harvest. And so uh, the, the owner of the field sends them out into the field and they work, start working at noon. Um, and then at, at, at three o'clock in the afternoon, some more laborers show up and says, yes, we've got some more room for, for workers. And then at five o'clock, just as people are like finishing up the work, some folks show up and just, you know, help with the, help with the sweeping up of, and putting the stuff away. Um, and the owner of the field calls all the, calls all the people in and, and says, I've, it's now time to be paid. And he begins by paying the people who showed up at five o'clock and he gives them, here is one denarius for you. Um, and so the people who were working at eight o'clock in the morning, the full day, think, all oh, right, we're gonna get it. And then the people at two o'clock, he says, here's the denarius. And the people at noon, here's the denarius. And then the people who eight o'clock in the morning, here's your, here's your one denarius that I offered you. And the people who worked all day think that is absolutely crazy and unfair and are, and, and the owner of the field basically says, you know, that's what, this is, we're practicing radical, radical equality here in this community. And Jesus gave that, Jesus gave that parable to say that is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And I think that's what sometimes work in, work in the church is like too. So that's one, that's one thought about, about work and leadership in the church. Another thought is that with that differentiation between we say, you know, being tough on, being tough on leaders and yet, and yet wanting leaders, I think that there is an, an urging and a longing for people to do, to do excellence in their work, um, but also this self-fear this self about if others, if others do it, what does, that, what does that say about, what does that say about me? And all of those forces, I think, exist within the church. So though, that's, my, uh, that's my gift to you, is the little magnets for, for sticking around and I want to do one more activity, one more activity um, about volunteers and leaders in the church. I know that if I tried to put together that list of names, that that list of names would be you know, incomplete and partial. And I think if we all tried together to put together the list of names, that list of names would be incomplete and impartial. But I want to invite you to not write down a list of names, but to actually create through our voices to create a roll call of volunteers and leaders in the church. And so I wanna invite um, people in sort of random scattershot form to call out loudly a name of someone you wish to honor for their leadership and their volunteering in the church this past year. Please know that um, you have my deep appreciation, all those names called and all those names honored and those unspoken and unhonored this morning. <laughs> 